without further ado, today we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Natasha Barlow. Um, Natasha is based at the University of Leeds. Um, she completed her undergraduate degree in geography and her PhD at Durham University. Um, she held positions as a postdoctoral research associate and a temporary lecturer at Durham before moving to the School of Earth and Environment at the University of Leeds in 2016. Uh, there she co-founded the Leeds Quaternary Group and is now an associate professor in Quaternary Environmental Change. Natasha's research focuses on past, present and future sea level, in particular developing records of past sea level to understand the magnitude, timing and forcing mechanisms of relative sea level changes over a variety of timescales. Natasha is a co-lead of PALC and in 2019 was awarded the QRA Lewis Penny Medal in recognition of her significant contribution to the quaternary stratigraphy of the British Isles. Currently, Natasha's research is focused on generating high precision reconstructions of sea level change during previous interglacial periods to improve predictions of future coastal response and ice sheet mass balance changes. And today, Natasha is going to be talking to us about the last interglacial, warm climates and high seas. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Over to you, Natasha. Thank you so much. That's a very, very kind welcome indeed. Right, we'll do the screen sharing. Okay, hopefully that's up. Shout if, uh, if you can't see it at all. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's great to, to be able to talk to you today. Apologies, my neighbours have just decided to take on uh, seemingly some DIY in the last five minutes. So if you can hear some knocking on the wall, that would be them. Timing is everything, so apologies for that. Okay, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about um, the last interglacial and particularly what it means for our understanding of high sea levels during warm climates. And as ever, this is not just my work, this is a body of work that comes from uh, the international community, in particular the PALSI uh, working group of PAGES and INQUA. I'm also going to touch a little bit on some of the work we're doing under the ERC funded RISER project. And I particularly just want to highlight the um, four early career researchers that are involved in that project. Um, in particular, Dr. Victor Cartege, who has um, been working on this for the last two and a half years, leading on the geophysics um, and the core collection. And Oliver Pollard, who's in the, just started the third year of his PhD on the ice sheet and solid earth modeling. And then Amy McGuire and Graham Rush have just joined us in the last two months, and they're going to be focusing on the next phase of the project, which I'll cover um, on the sort of microfossil and paleo environmental reconstruction. And though I'm the one here presenting, as is always the case, it's really down to these guys that, uh, that we've, we've got science and ex uh, exciting new results to be able to show you. So first off, just a little bit of background about sea level change, because I realise the Paleoclimate Society is kind of mixed in terms of its audience. So if you're going to take one thing away from today's talk, it's really I want you to uh, remember that sea level change varies around the world, and that's both in space and in time. This is just an example based on satellite data over a 22 year period from NASA. Um, but sea level varies spatially on glacial and interglacial timescales as well, the sorts of things that are interesting to us as paleo scientists. And the drivers of sea level change are varied and their contributions vary both in space and time. Really, of course, one of the main things that we think about as paleo scientists is the melt of the ice sheets such as Greenland and Antarctica. But that mass that these ice sheets contribute to the global oceans can be redistributed by things such as currents, and winds, and we can see also movement of water from land and sea by the hydrological cycle and changes in groundwater storage. Those changes in uh, loading on the land by glaciers and water also causes changes uh, of the solid earth, in particular the main process known as glacial isostatic adjustment. And all of these combination of processes mean that any place on the Earth's surface experiences its own changes in relative sea level as a consequence of all these different factors. Let's just have a little bit of a think about sea level uh, on paleo timescales. In particular, I'm going to focus on the Lake Quaternary. So here is the LRO4 stack from Mo Ramo and colleagues um, going back through the Quaternary to the mid Pliocene warm period. And we have a series of times when sea level was above Holocene pre industrial level. So this orange line is the mean value for the last 5,000 years of the Holocene. And you can see peaks in the blue that exceed this. So in particular, marine isotope stage five, around 125,000 years ago, and marine isotope stage 11, around 450,000 years ago, are some of our main indicators that sea level can be higher than present in geological timescales. We do have other periods, in particular stage nine and stage 31, 
and stuff going right back into the Pliocene, but the evidence for these are a little bit more sparse. And so that's really why for many of us, we have taken to focusing on the last interglacial, where we have far more extensive evidence of sea level and ice sheet changes um, during a warm climate. So what did the last interglacial look like? Well, uh, we use the term last interglacial, but also widely we use marine isotope stage 5E, which is the peak of the interglacial around 122, 125,000 years ago, depending on what metric you use to assess that by. Um, it also in Northwest Europe is termed as the Enian. So I apologize if I use those three terms interchangeably because they, they to a degree are. Following uh, the peak warmth during 5E, there are also a series of substages with a warm climate during 5C and also 5A, as we then start to go into the uh, last glacial maximum in stages four and two. During stage 5E, uh, so these are modeled outputs for 127,000 years ago, polar temperatures were warmer than present. And this is based on CMIP6, PMIP4 outputs from Betty Otto Blisner and colleagues published earlier this year from the models. And just really to highlight that over Greenland and the northern latitudes and also around Antarctica, we experience warm climates during this time. The models actually uh, don't necessarily quite fit with the data and some of the data that some of these come from Emily Capron's uh, papers published a few years ago now show that um, we don't quite hit in these models that actually how warm some of the proxy data records suggest. But it's important to note that the polar latitudes at least were uh, warmer than, than pre-industrial levels. However, the drivers of those that warm is different to today. And this is because the insulation patterns in stage five are different to those uh, in the Holocene. In particular, the peak in insulation was earlier in the interglacial, um, particularly in these northern latitudes, um, whereas in the Holocene, it's later. And also the intensity and the warmth of the insulation in the summers was a lot higher than it is in the Holocene. So though we see warming uh, at polar latitudes, it's really driven by these insulation patterns, whereas our warming of polar latitudes uh, in the present day and in the future is really driven by increases in CO2. So it's important to use these time periods to understand how ice sheets might respond to, to polar warming, but to just bear in mind that the drivers of the two are different. Based upon uh, these models of insulation and climate change, a lot of people have looked into modeling the minimum extent of both Greenland and Antarctica during the last interglacial. And there's still quite a lot of divergence in the outputs of those models. So there's just a figure here from a paper we had with Alan Hayward a couple of years ago, where we looked at nine different models of the minimum extent of the Greenland ice sheet to see how much agreement or disagreement there was between them. And in red is where there's the most agreement, i.e. all nine models overlap, and in blues and greens, there's less agreement. So you can see that we have some models where Greenland's very small during the peak of the last interglacial, and other models where Greenland's still quite large. And there's similar divergence on Antarctica as well. So there's no doubt, based on the modeling, that Antarctica almost certainly lost mass from the West Antarctic ice sheet. This is just one example from Chris Turney's group um, earlier last year. Um, but if we look at the spread in the outputs of the models after sort of nine, 10,000 years of warming, we can see that we're looking at somewhere between six, seven meters of sea level equivalent mass loss in terms of the difference of the, the mass loss from these models, depending on, on how these models are set up. So there's still quite a lot of disagreement in terms of how much these ice sheets could contribute to global sea level. So I'm not a modeler, I'm a sea level uh, field scientist and I go out and collect geological evidence of past sea levels, whether that be in the Holocene, last interglacial and, and some of the older periods as well. Um, and the reason for that is that we struggle to get direct evidence of ice sheet loss, particularly for these preceding warm periods because it's been removed by the subsequent glacials. But instead we can use the sea level data as an indirect proxy for ice sheet mass balance. So what does last interglacial sea level data look like if you're a field scientist? Well, here's just some examples. This is a raised shoreline from the last interglacial along the, the coast of California. And you can see here above the modern uh, sea level. Uh, these are examples of tidal notches in this case from the Mediterranean. These extend for many kilometers along the coastal cliffs of the Mediterranean, again, indicating that sea level would have been much higher than it is at present. Things such as coastal stalactites where these growths in the stalactites correspond to the water level. Um, the quite famous red sea curve from Elko Rowling and team, where we get a near continuous sediment sequence 
um, which records sea level within the Red Sea. And also probably the, the archive that's most widely used on this time scale is corals. Um, and you can see a lovely example here of paleo corals um, on a raised reef terrace in Bonaire um, that was provided to me by Alessio Rivero. And it, these, are the, these are some of the most commonly used indicators of last interglacial sea level, in particular because we can apply absolute dating methods to these. So just to give you a bit of a summary and a feel for the, the uh, <coughs> excuse me, the spread of data that we have now, this was a figure put together off the back of a Palsy meeting a couple of years ago, so it's a little bit out of date, but it's a nice illustration. In green are all the data points and locations covered for coastal um, archives of sea level in the Holocene from the whole sea database led by Nicole Kahn. Um, and in orange are all of those that at that point had been entered into the Wallace database, um, which is led by Alessio um, for the last interglacial. And that's currently um, actively being updated as that increases. But you can see we actually now have really quite a nice global spread of data for which to try and understand the spatial and temporal patterns of sea level change during the last interglacial. And this is kind of the trajectory that the, these records are taken. And I'm showing this as much as anything for you to see the differences that occur at some of the sites based on, on the interpretations to date. So one of the earliest last interglacial records was from the Bahamas, from Chenetal in 1991. And they showed a high stand, a small fall in sea level, and then a rise. And we see that in, in some other records as well. So Bill Thompson's 2005 record from Barbados. Um, and a not dissimilar shape, at least in Western Australia, but sea level in that case doesn't particularly fall. This is a, a more recent record from the Seychelles, which has got very nicely constrained chronology on it. But the, the shape of the kind of high stand, whether there was falls or not, it is not quite so well known due to the nature of the archive. One thing I just want to pick up on is this uh, record here. So these are, these are in time scales from 1991 to 2015 is when they were published. Back in 2009 now, which uh, surprisingly feels like it's whistled past very quickly, Bob Cott put together a global compilation using all of the then published records to look at how sea level may have varied during the last interglacial globally. So in terms of what we can turn global mean sea level. Um, and that, the, the sort of general shape of that that was inferred from this was a sea level rose to a high stand, fell during the middle of the interglacial, rose to a secondary high stand before falling as the interglacial ended. Um, and this is this record here again, and just a little bit more blown up. You can see that same shape here. Importantly, there was this period because of this double peaked high stand, or that sea level may have fallen. And this raised some very interesting questions because for sea level to fall in this record, which has been corrected for solid earth uh, changes, such as glacial or isostatic adjustment, that means that potentially ice sheets had to have regrown and gained mass in the order of about four to six meters global sea level equivalent. So a lot. But we have to get to a point that Greenland and Antarctica during the peak warmth of the interglacial can gain mass. Um, and that's slightly counter to kind of our understanding. And back now in 2018, we looked at paleo data from a range of different settings. So for example, IRDs from the Nordic Seas, the Erica Dome record, and particularly for that time period of 124 to 120, when this sea level fall was inferred to occur in the global compilation, to see whether there was any evidence for that regrowth. So kind of trying to analyze it separately from the sea level data. And our conclusion really is the summary title of the paper that we think there is a lack of evidence for a substantial sea level fluctuation within the last interglacial. And really now what's been shown and, and through Bob Cop's work and other people such as Andre Dusthaus is that um, that oscillation or that perceived oscill oscillation is almost certainly a consequence of the solid earth um, uh, correction that's applied to so the GIA modeling that's applied and which then infers that wiggle. That does not, however, mean that at some sites, sea level locally did not oscillate and possibly fall and rise again due to a whole combination of all of those factors that I outlined at the beginning. But we do not think that there is evidence for substantial regrowth of the ice sheets within the interglacial. They may well, however, have been a synchronous melt. So we end up with one peak because Greenland melted early, for example, or Antarctica melted early, it's more likely that sea level was then stable for a period, and then we got a second peak because we got later melting of integration. And I think that's almost certainly a very valid conclusion. So 
back in 2018, we questioned the nature of that fluctuation. But what I thought I'd do um, now was to just summarize really where we do think the state of the understanding is in terms of the global mean sea level. So in terms of that total value for the last interglacial. This is a figure that I'm sure many of you have seen. It's been widely used in many publications and presentations. Um, it was put together by uh, Andrea Dutton and, and former PALC leaders back in 2015. And it tried to summarize the state of understanding for the high standards for these previous interglacial periods. So obviously for this talk, I'm gonna particularly focus on stage five. So back in uh, 2015, uh, Andrea and colleagues suggested that global mean sea level during the last interglacial was in the order of six to nine meters above pre-industrial. In the IPCC AR6 report that was obviously published in the last few months, that range has been slightly revised. And now we think that potentially uh, sea level was in the order of five to 10 meters. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, hold on then, in six years, it's, our understanding's got worse. No, that's not quite true. Our understanding's got better and therefore our confidence has got less. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is things such as improved modeling of sediment loading, solid earth processes, and things such as dynamic topography, which I'll talk about um, in a bit later. And that then means that, in fact, we think there's uh, the potential for the high sand to have been in a larger range. That said, about two or three weeks, something like that, after AR6 was published, this paper came out from Dyer et al, where they used new records and new analysis from the Bahamas. And based upon that and glacier isostatic adjustment uh, correction, they think that global mean sea level is in the order of 1.2 to 5.3 meters. So lower than the range really suggested um, in AR6. So based on the last few months, our kind of updated understanding of the last interglacial high stand is in the order of about one and a half to 10 meters. But I think in reality, we'll, we're over the next five years, there's significant research going on in this regard from both the ice sheet community and also from the sea level community. That means I think we will be able to then once again, narrow this down a bit further. Okay, I mentioned that one of the significant sources of uncertainty in that range is the solid earth processes. And I just want to explore that a little bit uh, now. So glacial isostatic adjustment, I've mentioned this term a few times, but just for those of you for whom this is maybe not so familiar, simply it is the weight of the, the ice on the land that's then depressing the, the um, earth underneath it. So that during a glacial period, this large ice sheet here depresses the earth underneath, it moves the mantle material and is displaced out um, away from the ice sheet. And some people would know that as uh, that term as a four bulk area. When the ice then melts, that land surface slowly rebounds. And in fact, that mantle material that was displaced comes back to fill the voids that was left in between. And that in its most simplest form is what we know as glacier isostatic adjustment. The challenge is it varies spatially because of that mantle flow moving backwards and forwards and up and down over the duration of glacial and interglacial cycles. So here are two maps from Denby et al um, for both the start of the last interglacial and the end of the last interglacial. And these are just really focusing on the glacial isostatic adjustment component. So for these low latitudes and the start of the interglacial, we're seeing relative sea level changes in the orders of sort of two, three, four meters, just as a result of that mantle displacement and GIA. Whereas by the end of the last interglacial, the significant signal is up in the higher latitudes, particularly around um, North America, due to the retreat of the Laurentide ice sheet and around Antarctica. And here we're starting to see relative sea level due to GIA in the orders of eight meters, whereas in the low latitudes, relative sea level may have even fallen. So it's not simply a case of providing a single correction or even a linear correction to any of our sea level data. We need to consider these changes in space and time. The other complicating factor is that the preceding glacial period is really, really important in determining that pattern. So that that ice load and the distribution of the ice it has a significant impact on where that mantle is material is and isn't displaced from. So this is just uh, to give you an example. These are some models that were put together in that Denby paper. Um, I just highlight the, the two M members. So in green, we have a large Laurentide ice sheet and a small Eurasian ice sheet. These are really kind of conceptual um, models. So not that they're to, to illustrate the point as to why this is important. So this is the large Laurentide, whereas at the, the other extreme in purple, 
we have a smaller Laurentide, about half the size of the green model, and a much bigger Eurasian ice sheet. And that's because we don't necessarily understand the division between the Laurentide and Eurasia during stage six or the preceding glacial maximum. And I just want to point this out to illustrate why this matters. So this is our green line and this is our change in relative sea level through the preceding glacial maximum and up to present. So that when we have a small um, Laurentide ice sheet in the purple and a big Laurentide ice sheet in the green, we end up with differential patterns in Bermuda during the preceding glacial maximum as a result of that solid earth process. If we then get into the interglacial, we can see the implications again. So that if we have our small um, Eurasian and large Laurentide ice sheet, peak sea level during uh, the last interglacial in Bermuda can be about five to six meters lower than if we have the ice distributed effectively the other way around. So we have more ice in Eurasia and less in the Laurentide. And that difference in peak sea level is nothing to do with melt of Greenland and Antarctica. It is solely as a consequence of that distribution of the ice during the preceding glacial maximum and the consequence of the solid earth processes. So understanding the PGM is really important for us to understand the last interglacial sea level and then in turn to be able to understand the potential melt of Greenland and Antarctica on top. The second component of the solid earth signal that's become really important is dynamic topography. And this is convective mantle flow, um, which drives vertical changes in coastal um, uh, sea level markers. And Jackie Alsman in 2017 showed that this was actually important on last interglacial time scales, which we hadn't really considered. So it varies spatially depending on the mantle structure um, that we have around the world. And the implications are that sea level markers, so these are a whole example of different last interglacial sea level markers, their observed elevation may be quite different uh, versus uh, the elevation that they were deposited at because of that convective mantle flow driving vertical displacement. So to just put this in context, we have a range here of somewhere about 10 to 50 meters in total over which these values might have been um, just deposited and then vertically adjusted. The contribution to last interglacial sea level from Greenland, it, we think, is somewhere in the order of about two meters. So when we're trying to infer two meters of, of uh, ice sheet melt, we need to be pretty confident in our corrections here. And at the moment, that really is a source of uncertainty. Um, these, this, you know, this is one model. This is a hard thing to measure. Um, so this is one of the reasons that our estimate of global mean sea level has changed. Okay. Honestly, we do feel like we know more about the last interglacial, although I feel that that was a slight <laughs> sort of doomsday look as to where research has, has gone in the last five or six years. So I just want to touch on what some of the outstanding questions are, that, well, what I feel the outstanding questions are. So one of the things is we need a detailed uh, understanding of the solid earth processes, and that really needs a better understanding of the preceding glacial maximum or stage six ice sheets. We also don't really know when the sea level rise occurred and the rate at which it occurred. And that's because our chronology constraints currently are limited. So I mentioned a lot of our work is, or a lot of the international community's work is on corals, um, and that requires in general uranium thorium data. And for this time period, we're therefore looking at uncertainties on those in the orders of plus or minus two to 4,000 years. So it's very hard therefore to constrain rates of sea level change and therefore also rates of ice sheet melt. And we also struggle to understand where the water came from. So we think potentially, based on some work uh, published in the last couple of years, that there may be asynchronous melt of Greenland and Antarctica. But we don't really know that for definite at the moment. And they're kind of working hypotheses in the literature. So where are we from answer these questions? Are we going to the Bahamas and Bonaire and the Seychelles? No, no, the Leeds Riser Group and the Riser Project more wholesale with all our collaborators are going to the North Sea. Uh, which is not as glamorous, but it's a great location by which to do this work. And it's not just because it's next door um, it, to the UK, it's because actually it offers us a whole series of advantages. And the first one is actually, it's, it's, it's the geophysical component. So though this is a challenge, it's also one of the benefits of working in this area. So I mentioned that we are bothered about glacial ice static adjustment. That's very true. And that's very important in this area. I'll show a bit later. One of the benefits we also have here is what we term the gravitational attraction or the fingerprint of the ice sheet melt. So that when ice sheets are at their biggest, they attract 
water towards them, like, a, like the moon or any large body has its own gravitational pull. When the ice sheets melt, that gravitational attraction is weakened and the water is then piled up further away so that locations furthest from the ice sheet can experience a rise in sea level greater than the mean. And we term this the sea level fingerprint. And it results in spatial patterns that can look a bit like this. So this is just two examples. This is due to a melt of West Antarctica, and therefore locations closest to the ice sheet experience either a fall or um, very little sea level change that's shown by the blues and whites, whereas locations in the northern hemisphere experience a greater than mean rise in sea level. The mean is the black line. By comparison, if we have a melt of Greenland, the spatial fingerprint is in effect reversed, and the southern hemisphere experiences much greater sea level rise. Whereas, in fact, locations such as Northwest Europe will experience either negligible or negative sea level. Here's some of our key locations of our current last interglacial records, particularly from those coral locations, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. And you can see, regardless of whether we have an Antarctic or a Greenland melt, they're within the orange sort of colours. And therefore, they don't allow us to fingerprint the source of melt, whether it be Greenland or Antarctic. By comparison, the North Sea region is sensitive. It means that Greenland melt doesn't really register, but Antarctic melt will register quite significantly. We can in effect balance or weigh between our low latitude sites that colleagues have worked on and our new North Sea records to try and understand that spatial fingerprint. And that's the framework that we're working within in the RISER project. The other advantage is the North Sea is a great archive of environmental change. And we've been working now on several projects over the last few years, looking at this on a Holocene timescale, but also longer quaternary uh, glacial interglacial cycles. And that's because we have evidence in the North Sea of preceding glacial advances, their subsequent retreats, terrestrial and freshwater landscapes that then that follow, which in turn become coastal as sea level then rises. And we see this throughout the late quaternary. Here's an example of one of uh, the calls we have from the Holocene. This is a project that I'm working on with Dutch colleagues. And we can see our freshwater um, peatland environment here that was then transgressed um, during the, the early part of the Holocene. And, and we've got lots of examples of, of this. And it's, so it's a great archive for us to be able to look at that changes in environment. And then finally, the North Sea is currently undergoing an energy revolution, and this is providing a wealth of offshore data, which we've really been fortunate in being able to tap into, and in both this project, but also other projects we've been doing in Leeds. And that's particularly associated with offshore wind. You can see here, this is a map of a um, whole series of site allocations for offshore wind. Some of these are either developed in development or in the planning stages. Um, and these sites are providing us with a whole series of geophysical and core data. This is just one example of a, a location um, in the Netherlands. It's one of the a Dutch wind farm down here. And you can see all the seismic uh, track lines here, both in, in both directions, which are really closely spaced and with really high resolution because we're interested in imaging sort of top uh, 150 meters or so of the sediment for offshore wind. Um, and also associated borehole and cone penetration test locations as well. So using this data is allowing us to look in a lot of detail at the landscape. And this is just one example of many seismic lines that we have. This is open access data from the, the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. It's available for anybody to go and download. Um, so this is Victor Cartege's work, um, and Victor's gone through masses and masses of seismic data, to be fair, um, and has identified in particular horizons associated with that freshwater peatland landscape. So we see upper units, this very high um, reflector here, um, which is a Holocene peat, and then lower down, we see evidence of a similar reflector, um, which is associated with the last interglacial, so our Eemian peat layer. And it's really been those locations that we've been interested in targeting because, um, Using core logs that have come from the offshore wind industry, we can see very similar sedimentary uh, structures as we could see in that Holocene core of peats that are then overlain by marine clays, despite the fact these are Eemian and not Holocene, they look remarkably the same. Now, unfortunately, the geotechnical testing that's done on these cores means they get trashed. They're great calibration for us in terms of the core logs, but they're no use at all for us to do paleo-environmental reconstruction. So we haven't been able to just revisit this material, um, but it has been really important in terms of us planning the work we've been doing. 
So using all of that geophysical data, all these you know, thousands of kilometers of lines um, and the borehole record, Victor has been able to produce these maps of what the Eemian land surface would have looked like. So we can see that it deepens down as we go further offshore. The Netherlands is out, um, out here to the east in this particular site. And Victor then in turn is able to map the locations of these Eemian peat layers shown here in, the, in this brownie gray color. And by doing this, and through a lot of head banging and scratching our heads and backwards and forwards with wind farm companies and landowners and things, we eventually were able to identify five core locations shown in the yellow for which we targeted these peat layers to be able to collect our sediment. And you might wonder why some are here and not in the middle of here. It's things like there were pylon uh, drilling locations in the way, there were cables in the way, there were potential for unexploded ordinances, all these sorts of things complicated. So it's not simply a case of being like, I'd, I'd exactly like to do it here. Um, so this is our best, best data set based on all of the complicating factors we had to deal with. The other thing is we, we targeted these five locations for a specific elevation range that they cover. So here's our Seychelles and our Red Sea records that I mentioned previously, and they cover the early part of the interglacial. There's also this excellent uh, record of sea level from the Netherlands. Don't worry about the elevations here, this is entirely schematic. But um, that was published right back in 1983, right before its time, looking at exactly this, the transgress peak uh, units. But what we want to do in Riser and what we've targeted is we're trying to get um, records in the North Sea that overlap in terms of age with the earlier part of the interglacial and the records that come from the far field. There's very good geophysical reasons why these two are offset like this. It makes total sense geophysically in terms of solid earth response, but that's particularly why we've gone offshore to collect deeper cores so that we can test this idea about Antarctic Greenland melt um, using our records from the North Sea. And in some miracle, and I look back on this now and think I do not know how this happens, <laughs> despite two years of very hard work and the pandemic, somehow in the middle of last year, um, the cores were collected. Uh, because of the pandemic and other logistical challenges, none of us went offshore. It was entirely done under contract by Fugro, and I was a chief scientist from this very room, which was a little odd, but seemingly it worked. So this is the Norman flower that went out for us last summer, and this is a photo from the, the scientific officer on the, on the cruise, um, and this is the drill rig that was used Here's an example of one of the samples that came out the bottom um, where there was one or two samples where we had slight issues in collection, but nothing of concern. And this almost certainly is evidence of higher sea level or previous sea level, I should say, sorry, during um, the last interglacial. And then this is some of the cores arriving at Boss Cork in Southampton, who very kindly took them in for us because at that point the Leeds campus was shut. So through a lot of hard work of many people, we were able to collect these cores. And you guys are the first people outside the project to see this. This is an example of one of the core sites um, that we collected the material. And we've got five of these in total. And what's uh, interesting, so this is the bottom and they go up through here, up to the top here, is that these peat layers that Victor mapped are present in our cores, which is fantastic. We see a lower peat layer in every single core, which we assume from our, all of our preparation work is associated with Emian. And you can see that potential transgressive surface over the top here. We then see a second peat layer in every core um, we collected. We thought that might be the case, but we weren't 100% sure. We don't know what this is. Our working idea is this potentially a, a second stage 5e peat, and what we term an intercalated peat unit, which is evidence for changes in relative sea level, or it's a peat from a, a substage later in stage 5. It could be something totally different and we could be totally wrong, but at the moment I don't know the answer. So this is our, our working um, idea and we're just starting to get into this a bit more. So these are the five cores. And as, as I mentioned before, they're collected over an elevation range for us to track that, uh, that flooding and to try and get the early part of the interglacial. So here's that transgressive one at site four I showed you in the previous slide. And you can see this lower peak in the black um, that goes up over about a 15 meter elevation range. And here's the evidence here in each core log of these shallower peaks. Now, these are initial core logs we're working on currently doing the full core logs at the moment. But it really uh, has given us a lot of confidence. We're really, really pleased with these that actually we should hopefully be able to do what we set out to do. 
The other thing I just want to show you as well, which is also really new and exciting, again, nobody's yet seen, is the um, X-ray laminography images. And this is a brand new piece of kit called the uh, Scout Scan at uh, Boss Corps. Like we literally knew we were the first project to go through this. Um, in fact, we were the test core material. And what this has allowed us to do is to generate an effect to pseudo 3D image using um, an X-ray technique, which allows us to look at the sedimentary structures within the core before the cores are split. And therefore inherently we get a level of disturbance. And all of us, including the team at Boskov, have been blown away by the amount of information we've been able to, to get from this. And uh, sedimentology colleagues are really, really excited. And we're just kind of working this out at the moment. But just here's, here's an example to zoom in for you. This is the split core photograph that was taken afterwards. This is the X-ray um, uh, laminography image. And for example, we can see these onlapping structures and cross bedding, and we see all sorts of sedimentary structures that are not visible within uh, the split halves. So we're just working on this now. We're going to do detailed grain size analysis to test this, for example, but uh, really, really interesting results. And if any of you have similar core type material, I strongly suggest speaking to Boss Corps. Um, and exploring this opportunity. So as I said, we're just hitting the next phase and this is where Graham and Amy have come into the project and we're just going to start imminently. The test samples are in the lab at the moment. Microfossil analysis, particularly pollen, forams. Um, I might even look down a microscope at some diatoms and also chronology development to be able to develop models and landscape uh, evolution during this time period and also the rates of last interglacial sea level change. As I highlighted, that really is one of the significant uncertainties we currently have. We're going to take a range of different approaches. The pollen's really important due to the Eemian pollen zones that we have for Northwest Europe. We're just about to commence OSL sampling in the next couple of weeks. And we're also going to do amino acid dating with Percy Penkman's lab, potentially going to look for tephra layers as well, along with a range of other things we're exploring. So it's really kind of throwing all the, all the tools at it to see if we can then come up with some good chronology um, on the other side to then track over that elevation range that rate of sea level rise. So just to finish up, I just want to highlight the work that Ollie's doing, um, which is on the ice sheet and solid earth modeling, just a, a, probably a couple more minutes. As I said on this slide earlier, we really need to understand the preceding glacial maximum for us to be able to understand interglacial sea level. And this is really the focus of Oliver's PhD. So I can't cover his whole PhD um, and he should do that himself. But I just want to give you a, a sort of highlight of a couple of things he's working on at the moment. One of them is developing a new model for the Eurasian ice sheet for the preceding glacial maximum, focusing on the Eurasian ice sheet because that's the one closest to our field site. So that's the one that's going to have the most impact in terms of a solid earth response. And Oliver's using a model by Evan Gowan called Ice Sheet, um, which requires a series of impacts, uh, sorry, inputs to be able to come up with this new Eurasian um, model. In particular, the shear stress, which controls the basal sliding of the, shear, of the, um, of the ice sheet, and then in turn, its uh, thickness and development. So this is um, the shear stress map that Oliver's working on. This is just one example. In dark blue is the uh, last glacial maximum extent, and in the lighter blue is the maximum EMIM extent, and this is from the Bachelor paper from 2019. And We've got quite a lot of information in terms of the, the deposition of the ice sheet from the last glacial maximum, but of course it's quite hard to understand the depositional environments that underlaid the ice sheet during the preceding glacial maximum. So this is a source of uncertainty, but it's one which Oliver is exploring. And this is an example of what comes out of the ice sheet model. So here's one example of Oliver's outputs in terms of the thickness and the extent. I'm very sorry, I realize I've cut off the scale. Oliver, you can tell me off later. Um, the, to show, so in white, the ice is thickest and the dark blues, the ice is thinnest in this, in this model. Apologies for missing the scale. So um, Oliver's currently working on this and exploring all the different uncertainties that go alongside this. But the implications is then putting these ice sheet models into a GIA model, one example here, to then look at the changes in relative sea level as a consequence of that ice sheet melt and decay. And of course, we end up with quite a complicated spatial pattern because the Eurasian ice sheet extended right down through into the Southern North Sea. So 127,000 years ago, it's just one example. And our sites down here, we end up with sea level, or relative sea level lower than present, but in the Northern uh, North Sea, relative sea level almost certainly was higher than present due to GIA. So we end up with a very strong gradient. And um, 
Oliver is developing models and outputs of relative sea level curves during this time period. And again, exploring this range, which will then in turn allow us to take away the GIA component from our reconstructions on the cores and then infer our Antarctic Greenland fingerprint. So it's a, it's a whole series of bits of puzzle that have to go together before we can do that fingerprinting idea I outlined at the beginning. Okay, um, so work in progress in terms of the rise of project, but um, yeah, as I said, you've seen some, some new uh, data that nobody else has yet seen. So hopefully that was interesting and um, you know, watch this space over the next two or three years in terms of uh, the results we come out with. But in summary, uh, our current understanding places global mean sea levels somewhere within the one and a half to 10 meter range. Now that's large, I realize, but that's really the state of the understanding as the last few months. Um, but I do hope that we'll refine that over the next three to five years through a whole combination of projects. The source and rate of interglacial ice melt is currently poorly constrained, and that really is a focus of ongoing work. And we're working in particular in the rise of uh, project to develop better understanding of the rates of last interglacial sea level change to be able to infer that ice sheet um, evolution. But as I've highlighted now several times, and I think it's important for the paleoclimate community to consider, is that the size and distribution of the stage six ice sheets is really important for us to be able to understand in turn interglacial sea levels. Thanks very much. <laughs>